I think it's quite clear that there are both clinical and theoretical reasons for why it's important to study music in neurodevelopmental disorders. An obvious clinical application is therapy. Speech therapy is often adopts aspects of music therapy, especially in trying to fine-tune auditory processing and possibly extend memory in children developmental disorders. So there is a really direct link between empirical studies and therapy in that the empirical studies can provide a scientific basis that therapists can use to develop different kinds of approaches to working with these children. If we think about neurodevelopmental disorders, we've got to think about them very much in a different context to the way we would think about adults with brain damage. These children are processing music in an atypical way from the beginning of life. So we might find that these children love music, have an affinity to music, listen to music, but the kind of things that they're encoding about music, the kind of memories that they're laying down are, may well be different to the kind of memories we'd see in a child who is typically developing. So if we think about some of the cognitive and perceptual mechanisms that are, that are affected in neurodevelopmental disorders, we can see that a lot of those are really crucial for music perception. That children with neurodevelopmental disorders often experience problems in aspects of perception and cognition that are likely to impact on their perception of music. So we see problems with perceptual skills, we might see, for instance, in some language disorders, difficulties discriminating pa and ba, and that's problematic. It might be problematic for discriminating different musical tones. We might see children who've got problems with aspects of short-term memory, of long-term memory. We have problems with sequencing. We might have problems with extracting structures from information. For example, with Williams syndrome, we know these children have problems with pattern perception. And we would well predict that pattern perception is very important for music and so we're going to see impairments in those areas of music that involve pattern perception. Disorders like specific language impairment where we see difficulties with language. We can see that we see very very similar difficulties within music and this speaks to musical of theories of music that, that talk about shared resources. So we've got a very important model by Annie Patel in America that talks about how syntax in music and syntax in language share cognitive and neural resources. So the neurodevelopmental research can speak to that. For example, with SLI, the kinds of problems we see in processing syntax, we see during the processing musical harmony. So that's just one example of, of how we can take theory forward in terms of music, in terms of, and in terms of developmental disorders. Ideas about associations between music and language, we know that when we're processing emotions in speech and in music that we rely on very, very similar psychoacoustic cues. And so we can look at, look at that, we can look at whether or not children who are not doing very well at recognising emotions in voices, and we see that in children who are visually impaired, are we going to see similar kinds of effects in music? And if we find that musical emotions are very much easier to recognise than vocal emotions, we might be able to use that in a therapeutic context. I think that one of the things that has, has become much more apparent in recent times is that it's relatively rare for a child to have one neurodevelopmental disorder. So when we look, for instance, at autism, we see lots of children have motor difficulties, so we lots, see lots of developmental coordination problems in these children. 
We see comorbidity with other kinds of disorders as well. We see language problems. So for instance, some children with autism have specific language impairment. If we look at children who have visual and auditory impairment, we see fairly high levels of autism. We even see some children with Williams syndrome meeting diagnostic criteria for autism. So we, we see these very mixed patterns of difficulties in a lot of these children. Um, and I think that we're seeing increasingly a tendency to compare developmental disorders against each other. And that's very helpful in terms of thinking about which factors are unique to this disorder and which factors do we see across both disorders. Okay. So a good example of that is if we look at specific language impairment and dyslexia, we do see a proportion of people who have both disorders, but we do see that those disorders can be discrete and that they have specific profiles associated with them. We have good evidence now that music therapy is very, very useful with autism. So we have good randomised trials showing that music therapy can help with the core disabilities in communication. We also have excellent work from America showing the use of music to um, elicit speech in nonverbal children with autism. We, we know that music work, works to reduce anxiety in some developmental disorders. If we think about what music can do for us, it can do so much because we can use music to help us emotionally. We can use music to, an, to, to enable us to bond with other people when we've got a social communication difficulty. And then if we come down, right down to the building blocks of music, we can use music to fine tune auditory perception, which might help with phoneme discrimination, for example. So in that case, having music lessons and learning how to um, analyse pitches more effectively generalises to language domains so that we can see some knock-on effects for children that are having difficulties with language. We might be able to use the rhythmic, rhythmic aspects of language to help children with motor impairments. And of course children that have got problems with motor functioning, if we can if we can motivate that child to start learning a musical instrument, we might very well be able to help the child develop fine motor skills. Um, we might be able to use music as a medium because it's more emotionally engaging. The child might be more willing to engage in, in what's quite burdensome, you know, practicing hand movements when you have problems in motor skills in respect to music than in respect to other kind of therapeutic approaches. There's probably a huge amount that we don't know about neurodevelopmental disorders and music. It's some groups of children with neurodevelopmental disorders are extremely difficult to test. So for example, I once carried out a study into, into emotion recognition with children with Down syndrome. And the children didn't really didn't do very well at all. But I don't doubt for one second that these children are extremely responsive to music. I've seen this so many times. The experimental paradigm required the child to listen to the music, look at some pictures and decide which picture matched the music. And the child was much more interested in looking at my face. And it was very, very difficult to get the child to do this. So from the empirical evidence so far, we can't say that children with Down syndrome are totally alive to music, but they probably are. Similarly, children with autism that are intellectually low functioning, I think all the evidence is that they really are very, very responsive to music. But the kind of paradigms we use in psychology mean that we can't really test this very well. We also know that children can have problems with some aspects of music. So for instance, Williams syndrome um, is characterized by pattern, um, pattern processing problems, but these children still love music. 
are these children listening to music in a different kind of way? Music's rich in timbre, it has pulse, it has tempo, rhythm, all these different components. It might be that not being able to encode melody isn't all that much of a problem, that it's still extraordinarily rich despite these kinds of impairments. And for children with SLI, you know, we're seeing auditory memory problems. We have carried out research showing very poor um, memory for music in SLI, but we've still seen some emotional effects um, of music in that music will prime certain kinds of responses, which does suggest that it is still having some kind of an effect. So again, here, we don't have paradigms that are sensitive enough to be able to really show us what's going on with these children. And of course, if we use a, a paradigm that disadvantages those children, because it requires some aspect of tension or memory or motor control, we could very easily conclude that these children are not doing very well, when in fact, it's really us that aren't doing very well in terms of developing paradigms that are suitable with these groups. So I think we need to really harness all of our imaginative skills to start thinking about music in, in these kind of children.